uh, I uh, am very grateful for this opportunity to be here in front of all of you and to be able to share the work uh, that Amita has done along with its collaborators. And, uh, and so I will we'll kind of uh, change gears from nanotechnology so we now roll up our sleeves and we get busy with our hands, okay? So I start with my presentation and my presentation's focus is on women, empowerment, and technologies for skill development. And we live in a world of changing environments, right? And the one critical way to survive in a changing environment is to make sure that you have the skills to survive in the changing environment. So we need to continuously either update our skills or acquire new skills to survive in this kind of an environment. And uh, um, you go next. And this is kind of where we come in. Um, our uh, lab, our research and development lab is called Amachi Labs. Uh, it's Amrita Multimodal Applications and Computer Human Interaction Labs. We are a multidisciplinary group of about 85 people. Um, we have engineers of every shade and color. Uh, we have artists, we have artisans, we have uh, videographers, we have psychologists, we have anthropologists all working together with one focus is uh, skill development. And the one thing that makes us, uh, and uh, these are the research areas we work in, we primarily work in the areas uh, from very technology very technology-based uh, research all the way to social sciences. We work with haptics, we work with motor skill learning, uh, robotics and automation, uh, learning technologies, computer human interaction, and in social sciences, specifically empowerment studies. And the one thing that differentiates us is that we are very human-centric in our approach uh, to research and uh, development. So we really involve our end user, and therefore it's kind of very critical to design who our end users are. So when you talk about changing environments, uh, one of the groups that is the most uh, disproportionately affected, one of the most vulnerable groups is women. And with women come children, and with women come the elderly, because women are usually primarily the caretakers of the elderly. And these are the three vulnerable populations in any changing environment, whether it's disasters, or whether it's climate change, uh, any of the main uh, contributing factors. And therefore, our work has primarily focused on women empowerment, not just uh, for those reasons, for also the reasons that women make up half the population in the world, and when you empower a woman, you automatically empower the household. Uh, these are uh, well-established facts. Yeah. Actually, would like to share a story with you on this. Um, around, uh, it was around, I think, 2003. Um, I was discussing with Amma on the issue of uh, rehabilitating women who were victims of sexual exploitation and trafficking. And the one key thing that everything came back to was that we needed to give them skills. And uh, Amma at that point of time shared a story with me and she told, um, in olden days, uh, if there was a woman and she was a widow and she had a couple of children, she could actually live off the land that she, was, she, she had and she, there maybe were like five to 10 coconut trees growing in her heart in her yard, she could grow some vegetables. Uh, she would call the coconut tree climber, who'd come and pluck the coconuts. She would pay him two coconuts. She would keep three coconuts for herself and sell five coconuts, and she could kind of manage with the vegetables, with the coconuts. Um, she could kind of manage her life. But you, could, you can't do something like that nowadays. You don't have coconut tree climbers to begin with to get down your coconuts. You can't pay the person in coconuts, and you cannot sell five coconuts and manage your life. And uh, it's a changing environment and the woman needs to adapt to this kind of changing environment. So what kind of skills can you teach women and what kind of solutions can you give to women? And so it's, it's really livelihood skills and it nearly is vocational skills that you have to give women so that they can kind of cope up with this environment. And so if you look at just the, the skill development challenges in India, I mean, the challenges are, are humongous. I mean, just start with the population. Uh, the economists say that we need to train 500 million Indians by 2020. And by 2030, that number rises to 900 million Indians. And if you just think of the numbers, it's just, it's like ridiculous. And so you definitely have to have some kind of a technological intervention to address this kind of an issue. And so, um, so when you think about education and you think about scale, you always think of something like, uh, 
Oh, this is again just the challenges of education in India. Um, yeah, you think about something like MOOCs for vocational education, right? And so when you think of MOOCs, you think of video lectures, you think of interactive games, and you think of online assessments and things like that. So you can you can address it, but can you think, for example, of a plumber standing in front of a camera and giving a lecture, and that would be your plumbing course? It doesn't quite work that way, right? So. When you think of lectures for vocational training, you have to rethink of how your lectures are delivered. You have to rethink of how you're going to train a person, because you're not going to train them with theory first and then move to practicals. It doesn't work. So you have to start with competency-based training. So your whole um, delivery model has to change. Um, the whole user interface and user interactions have to change, because most of the population, if you go to the previous slide, they're either semi-literate, neo-literate, or they have uh, really no exposure to these kinds of education, so all these technologies, and so you'll have to redesign from colors, from the glyphs that you use, you have to redesign the entire interaction that a person has with the computer. And you have to make it language independent, because India has so many different languages. So these are all the kind of considerations you want to take before you design something, and thanks to our human-centric design, Every time we made a mistake, we could go back to this drawing board. And these are all things that we learned while actually building these courses. So if you start with our earlier courses and our later courses, you'll find there's an evolution um, in how we actually teach it. And we also let them learn technology very progressively. You don't slam them with technology. Te technology is almost transparent to begin with. And then slowly they start getting used to using the technology and making it a little more fancy to use. But this is one component of learning. But in vocational skill, there's a huge component that is uh, what you have to do with your hands, right? So how do you teach them how to do something with their hands but using technology? So you have these kind of technologies. It's very fancy technology uh, called virtual reality simulators. And my presentation is stuck. Yeah. So yes. So. When you learn to do something with your hands, uh, you have to feel what it is that you're doing. So the sense of touch is called haptics, and so we had to build uh, devices that could teach people how to touch a virtual world, how to manipulate a virtual world, and how to learn to do things with their hands using technology. And so um, we were very inspired by the work that was done by one of our, collab our collaborators here, Professor Kenneth Salisbury from Stanford. He is, if I may say so, almost like the father of haptics. And so we were inspired by his work. And we built our own first haptic device in India, which is the, the top one there. We call it the APTA, which is the linear haptic device. It can simulate about 18 different tools in the construction trade. And from there, we kind of started making a whole bunch of prototypes and devices. Two of our devices are currently being used by the largest construction company in India, Larson and Tubro, in their training institutes. And so we use these devices to teach people physical skills. And then, okay, so this is the second component, and Professor uh, Salisbury will talk a little more detail about the haptic devices. The third main component of uh, our learning is life skills. When Amma spoke, she said, education for livelihood and education for life, right? So you have to actually bring these two things together to make something work. Now, We've heard Amma say that before, and so we made sure that we had this as one of the components of education. But we did not, what we did not realize is what a big component this was. We did it, it was fine, but, it, and we used technology, which was great, and everybody loved the technology, everybody wanted to play, we had no problem getting people to sign up for our courses, but what kept them in the course was the life skills education. And so over time, we have actually redefined this life skills education to consist of four main topics, which is sanitation and safety, personal commu and community development, awareness of infrastructure and services, and information via computing and mobile technology. And we cover all kinds of social democratic topics like domestic violence, child sexual abuse, land rights, dowry, anything that you can think of. Uh, are, they're, they're covered in this, uh, in this uh, section. And uh, we have a very blended learning approach in how we roll out uh, this education. So they learn the life enrichment education and the courses on, on technology, using technology, 
uh, they learn the physical skills using a simulator, but they have a hands-on element for both, where they actually have contact hours with a mentor, and uh, they do practicals, and finally they come to an assessment. Now there are two kinds of assessment in this. One is for the vocational trade that they have learned, and the second assessment is for the, the life skills that they have learned. And they have to implement both locally, uh, and that's what we test them out of. So if they have learned, for example, uh, masonry, they actually build themselves a toilet or a house, something that, that they physically build and as a local implementation. And if it is something like, uh, like fabric painting or artificial jewelry making, then they actually make products and they have an exhibition sale and they make money at the end of the sale. That is one of the assessments. And if it is a life enrichment, uh, life skills uh, assessment, they have to identify a societal problem, work together, and these are women who are working together in groups, self-help groups, and they have to identify a problem, come up with a solution, and implement that solution, and that becomes the assessment for life skills training. And some, some of the results that have come up from this are remarkable. Like we have had one group uh, from Manandavadi, which is like a tribal area in Kerala, they managed to close down an alcohol shop that was in, on the route to their school, their children going to school. Um, the, women, the young girls would be harassed by drunk men every evening when they were coming back from school, and so the, the mothers thought it was a problem. They got together and closed down the shop. There was another group of tribals that actually petitioned for some land rights. I think somebody was acquiring their land. <coughs> and uh, they petitioned and they got back their land from the government. Things like that, and some of those things were so remarkable that uh, they had work, we had worked to train 3,000 women as a part of the UNDEF project, and uh, the project was very well received uh, with very good recommendations uh, from the then uh, resident coordinator of the UN uh, and the UNDP. Oh, sorry. If I get it, I will be some so I'm just gonna let you read it. Oh, that's good. So, but we, we have all these technologies, right? But how do I make sure that the, the world at large can use it and we also can use it like in, in more than just one place? And so we had to figure out how you could actually scale our model. And so we had to build or to use technology also to scale it and to deliver it. And so, right, of course, scaling has its own problems. We have to study the problems. And through our deployments, we realized that we had to figure out three main elements of it, which was education, community, and livelihood. And we had to make all these three, three things work together in a, by using technology. And so what we did is we decided to build a portal that would bring education, would bring uh, jobs, and bring the community together. So if you take, uh, for example, Udemy, uh, Khan Academy, Coursera, and, you, and uh, LinkedIn, and maybe, I don't know, in India we call it Baba Jobs. I don't know what the equivalent over here is, but you put that into Facebook. That's kind of what we've built in our portal um, so that uh, you can create, um, when, once you have education, it, it transfer. if you have online education, it is only meaningful if you have certification and that's the only way you can get into livelihood. And if you want the community of people to invest in education in form of mentoring people online, uh, you have to create a community of mentors. Uh, you have to create what you call as communities of practice, is people who are practicing a particular trade together, uh, what we call e-guilds. Oh. oh God, yeah, I have only two minutes. <laughs> I have a lot to say, sorry. So we also tried, uh, we also worked on uh, solar powered classrooms that we've taken to the villages. I, I'm going to go at breakneck speed and because I have to finish my presentation. And the three main pillars of our strategy have been uh, community mobilization, um, uh, capacity building, and sustainability. So right now, the project that we're working in on is sanitation, and uh, for the reasons that you can read, distance, dignity, privacy, health, and security. And we teach the women to build their own toilets and, uh, and maintain them. And they can use the same thing as in, to make money, and they can build toilets for other people in the same village. And that's the project that we're working on right now. 
we have eight centers out of our 33 centers eight centers are doing toilet building and literally i think in the last month and a half we built close to 90 toilets um, we've trained about 95 women um, we've got at least 400 people have been trained in sanitation awareness and uh, yeah it's going very well as a story of sakri ben from gujarat she came up signed up for our course she's learned toilet building uh, she learned masonry and uh, plastering and uh, we came back like three weeks later to Gujarat and we found that she'd actually built her own kitchen after she built her toilet and then she decided that she wanted to take it up further and the, the seventh picture shows Sakri Ben leaving her village to go to the closest industrial training institute to get herself certified as a professional mason. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience for everybody to work on the things. So when we work in the villages, we don't just send social workers. Every single member of the lab has to go to the field and spend at least one month in the field. It's, it's compulsory in Amachi Labs. And along joining us are always people from, from other parts of India and from other parts of the world, which is where the Living Labs come in. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Sylvia Hostetler from EPFL Lausanne will talk a little more about uh, the Live in Labs part of it. We've had more than 50 international students who have worked with us. In the picture down here is uh, Marius. Marius and Alex are here somewhere. They have worked with us in the villages. They've done some wonderful work. And this is our, um, our very own Amachi Labs. Uh, uh, he's a computer programmer, and he decided to teach children computer programming, um, not children, children, but young adults computer programming. So he taught them using games. So computer games to teach them the concepts of computer programming. He just gave them tablets and let them lose on it. And they finished almost every single level, not all of them, but a lot of them did. And so the ones that were best in picking up these principles were then introduced to MIT's logo programming. And from then, from there, they're planning to take them to a full on uh, vocational course, uh, like a short term, uh, like a Red Hat Linux kind of a programming course, so that they can get a good vocation from this. And it's interesting that one of the students that topped this was a 17-year-old girl who had dropped out of school. She dropped out in her eighth grade, and she just aced this test. And for those who did not understand the spatial part of it, he had de designed a tangible interface to teach them. And this tangible, in this uh, student who was in this picture, he actually did four months with EPFL at EPFL Lausanne with Professor Pierre Dillenberg, who is an expert in tangible interfaces for vocational education. So this is another collaboration coming in. So you remember I talked to you about coconuts uh, and coconut trees and the lack of people to climb and harvest coconut trees. It's a skill gap. There are a lot of skills that you need that are dying out, and this is where the robotics and automation parts fits in. Uh, we have already uh, people in at Amrita working on this, with Prof Professor Rajesh Kannan, um, who has worked on a coconut tree climbing robot, uh, the picture over there. And uh, it, the robot climbs up the tree and harvests the coconut. <laughs> and comes down. And so we're also looking into how we can address these skill gaps using robotics. Because dignity is a word that has been thrown around so much in today. And dignity and the kind of jobs that you do should not be demeaning and should not be dangerous. And so it's very important to build, bring in these kind of technologies to address that kind of a need. 